Yeah, well, it's a tough business, isn't it? If we if we come back to focusing a bit more on you, Michael, and, and again, more questions coming, I'm trying to get as many answers as, as I can. If I, ca- I haven't got to a question, I can only apologise. But uh, I will ask this one, which is a little plug for us because uh, uh, from our Crash YouTube channel, so do make sure you check out that and, and give it a subscribe. Jordan, who does all our brilliant videos, uh, wants to ask you, was there a moment when you rode in MotoGP when you saw a rider do something and just thought, wow, how has he done that? <laughs> Actually, uh, Mark, in, in 2013 and 14, I used to see him several times in throughout practice uh, weekends. And he he just had that aggressive factor, but he'd come drifted up the inside, miss the apex, completely blow the corner, still drag it around there. And, and most other people would, you know, they know I was in a CRT bike, they just blow by you if they wait till you get round the corner and he just smoke you on the straight. But he just was attacking every single corner and his ability right from the word go of I remember actually being at my first test in Sepang and half the paddock were saying he's going to have to adapt he's going to have to smooth things out change his style because this is never going to work he'd crash too much but actually watching those initial <laughs> laps he was doing back in 2013 in his first season it was a joy to behold to witness it and it was a bit special it actually wasn't the fastest way because you would see the likes of Jorge Lorenzo and you'd follow him and he was pinpoint accurate and it was just so smooth to watch. It was like silk. But then Mark was just aggressive on the absolute limit. And um, yeah, it was interesting to watch the two varying riders uh, close up in, in that season. But um, but yeah, I think Mark was the one for me doing stuff that I knew just wasn't, wasn't possible on two wheels, in my opinion. But he's done that for years, hasn't he? <laughs> Well, so Wissam has asked, uh, Rossi or Marquez? <coughs> oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> uh, both uh, both were very different, very different um, approaches. I, I was always a fan of Valentino, but he's been a chameleon as well, changing from 500 two-strokes to, to V5 four-strokes to, um, to then adapting to Yamaha. He didn't quite adapt to the Ducati, but I think the longevity of his career and still in 2015 battling for that championship with um, with the the young crop coming through, so I think what Valentino's achieved and w- what he's done with a smile and the people he's brought into the paddock, you know, from that perspective, no one will ever touch Valentino Rossi. But Mar Marquez for his raw speed, like a Casey Stoner before him, just witnessing that boundary breaking ability to to uh, create a new riding style that everyone's emulated to be the the really a pioneer out there who's who's just uh, pushing the barriers every single weekend pushing those boundaries of what's possible i think yeah mm. i couldn't pick either either one of them to be superior to the other but both exceptional talents impossible question impossible um and actually this, <laughs> this one that next one could be both for, for for both of you really uh marty hill um uh michael who is the best teammate you've ever had in your racing career well, that's an interesting one. I've had some some uh, good teammates over the years. Back in in um, in my early days, being team with Jeremy McWilliams was for me something a bit special because I always looked up to Jeremy through my younger years. We got to be teammates in BSB for for Jez's first year back into a national championship. Then um, had good fun with the likes of Brock Parks. Brock had just gone through a divorce and was um, was. Uh, drowning his sorrows that year so we had some good Sunday nights together a few beers and that side of it was good fun um but yeah I think uh actually um yeah I've never had a bad teammate so I got on with everyone with it whenever I was in BSB with uh with Tommy Hill with uh Christian Eden with um Michael Rudder before that with um with all the guys throughout my career it's been uh yeah it's been been um, always good to have that good relationship you always reach a point in some time inside the garage whenever you want to be beating your teammate but i always keep managed to keep it cordial and and I'm, i'd say i'm friends with them all now which is a nice thing no bitter fallings out then keith uh, go who was your favorite teammate <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you obviously haven't um, because you don't go back far enough because you're too young Harry you, you you've not seen some of the um the previous press back in the day um probably one of the the, the most uh, I mean one of the most difficult um teammates that I ever had was obviously Sheen at Suzuki when I rode with Suzuki um Barry and I and we kn- we'd known each other for a, for a couple of years purely and simply because you know I'd been drafted in the British transatlantic team when uh, when I was going quick and and joined Barry later on at Suzuki when they decided to sign me up as well. And his mum and dad, Frank and Iris, had looked after me and my then, the mother of my oldest daughter, Carolyn, um, 
when we first got to Grand Prix, we were youngsters, never had any food, never had any money. Frank and Iris would always look after us. And Barry, of course, in later years became my teammate. And 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 kind of once you become, as Michael just said, you know, competitive, trying to keep it cordial, well, you never really could. I mean, you never really could. And there were all sorts of shenanigans that went on behind the scenes in Suzuki at that time when uh, Barry was sort of, he was obviously the big star. But at the time, he was coming back off of a massive injury and, and I was beating him, uh, even in Grand Prix. So um, so it was difficult for him. I mean, I'm not putting myself in the same place as Sheen. He was a great. Um, but at the time, you know, I was going quite quick. And it was a bloody lesson to learn the politics of a team. Back in the day, you didn't have all of that. You know, Michael will be very, very familiar with the political landscape nowadays in broadcasting, in, in racing, in in that side of things, whereas we were completely oblivious to it, ignorant even of politics, of, of, of your own personal politics, let alone your own team politics and the wider world's politics. It was something you never touched you. You race, you race motorbikes. You just enjoyed riding motorbikes. That's all you particularly did. But from a teammate point of view, I think Sheeny was the one where I had to grow up and I had to learn a lot. When it came to broadcasting, I don't know where Michael's inspiration comes from or, or, or what he looked at and thought, you know, that might work for me. I quite like that, that that's the way I would like to be seen or do. For me, it was Sheen because whenever you saw Sheen in an interview, um, he would always say exactly what he needed to say for the broadcaster so they never, ever dumped the piece that he was involved in. And he always managed to fit in that piece the relevant points that he wanted to get across. Sponsor, you know, what's coming up next, what Barry Sheen's, you know, week is going to be like. It was a really skillful way of manipulating the media, but still giving them what they want without them dumping it. Because editing is, is the worst thing. Obviously, you can, you know, you can say what you like to a broadcaster, but if they don't like it and it's going out later, they'll edit it down to nothing. A bit like this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I might not be in it. <laughs> It's <laughs> the point is that, that, that that's the way Sheen operated, and he was a he was a professional. Oh, he was a global icon. I mean, you've got to look at him as he was a superstar around the world when the World Championship was a European Championship. You know, he he reached parts of the world that that that, that weren't reached by our own series at that time. So Sheen probably was the the biggest, certainly the biggest name I ever rode with. Um, certainly the the man I learned the most from, um, not perhaps riding wise, but every every other aspect. Well, let, let's put that to you, Michael, shall we? Just on the on the broadcast side, how how was that to to adapt to suddenly you know being being a broadcaster? Because you know not every former rider or rider, current rider can can make that jump very well. But it certainly seems that <laughs> he didn't want to do it. it. <laughs> he didn't want to do it. I can tell you, it took persuasion. <laughs> yeah, weirdly, I still I was. 37 years old or 36 when I first started and I was still just as a racer you're so focused on what you're doing with racing I'd wanted to keep racing and I still felt that I had a lot to give as a BSB rider and world endurance rider and um and yeah I, I was actually was very fortunate conversation with Keith and Keith was the one who got me the job in, in BT Sport I got to dip my toes in in 2018 and do it alongside BSB commitments and towards the end of that season then the opportunity to, to go full-time the year after was presented to me but it meant obviously stepping away from racing and at first I was like no I'll, I'll keep racing and then I thought about it and spoke to my <laughs> friends family and got a, a bit of advice and thought you know what the time is right sometimes it, it takes something to happen to to know it's time to step away from racing but I probably would have been still racing now at, at 40 years old I'd have been still out there pushing if the the um, broadcasting career hadn't uh, hadn't uh, sort of landed for me so it, it's worked out really good and I've got to say thanks to Keith for for um, believing in my ability I had got a little experience a few dips into World Superbike with with Eurosport I'd done some BBC Northern Ireland stuff in the Northwest 200 and I knew I could talk at least I could and I felt comfortable enough in front of the camera and then whenever you make the transition commentary so different again from from being asked a question as a pundit so it's been a learning process and one I've enjoyed actually getting my teeth into that as well. No, it's been brilliant to watch. I'm assuming Keith takes commission, obviously, um, from that. Or <laughs> I tell you made what, a mistake there, Keith. It's uh, from 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 all of our points of view. I think it's television. It, it's a funny thing, isn't it? Because I mean, the the thing I always set out to be. I became a presenter on television back in the day. Obviously, uh, uh, you know, I went to commentaries some six or seven years ago. To those that are very young, but 
I always presented television. The only reason for that was money. I didn't want to see myself on, on TV particularly. But my style, I would hope, and I would hope it was recognised, and I'm going to be mortified if anybody writes in and says the opposite. But I always wanted to make sure that the, the, the star that, that was on our show was the star. I didn't. I don't believe it's about the presenter. I don't believe it's about the the, the guy that is the presenter is re, or the girl that is the presenter really should be enhancing the the people that they are presenting. You know, the races, the riders, the sport itself. Yeah, of course you can be so good at it, you become a star yourself. But it's still the main focus for me was always on the people that are in the show, the people that were providing the show for us, and. Uh, and and that's basically the only and I didn't learn that from anybody. That was just how I wanted it to be for for me. And I think Michael, I could see how good Michael was with his words. He could make a complicated bloody rule simple and make it in, in a sentence. And again, I'm blowing smoke up your kilt again, Michael. I started the show by doing that, and I'm doing it again now. But it was a skill you had that you didn't really recognise. But I knew how difficult it was to achieve what you seem to be able to do easily. So that's how that came about. And that's why I was at probably, I mean, you're the only one ever that I've been a little bit forceful over saying you should take this on. Um, there were two reasons for it. You, you, with respect, your riding career wasn't going to get any better than it was at the point you were at at that time. Your age, you weren't going to get any younger. These are all very hard <laughs> lessons yeah, that you learn. It's very hard to give up riding, um, particularly when you enjoy it and you're, you're still relatively good at it. But the point being is that, that I could see a long career in broadcasting for you around our sport. And you kind of, it kind of needed that nudge. You just kind of needed that little tiny nudge into it. And look where it's gone. I mean, it's fantastic. I mean, it's, a, it's an example to anybody, any rider, all those riders that, that kind of in their heart still want to ride, but know it's, it's all but over. Uh, you've got to make that jump. If you see the opportunity, you've got to grab it. And I think that that's, Again, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite, pr- I, I, and I don't take a mission by the way. I am absolutely proud of what Michael's achieved. I really am, and he, and he does things. I mean, here's, here's one that really blew me away. The first time that he had to stand and do a piece to camera, doing a piece to camera. Harry, you'll be familiar with this. Pete, you might be as well. But when you have to stare at the camera in a noisy environment with a load of goons all around the back of the camera, <laughs> all looking at you as well as the camera looking at you and you've got, you know, a sound guy and a, 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 obviously the cameraman's there as well. And they're, they kind of got to move on to the next piece quite quickly. And you've got to say 10 or 15 or 20 seconds worth of words. And they're specific to go into the next piece or into that particular part of the show and to look at the camera and deliver that in a meaningful way without looking like a complete dick. <laughs> in, well, for me, obviously, in pop- <laughs> for Michael, he did it really, really well. <laughs> and I remember the first time I remember thinking, huh, watch out for this boy. He's on his way. Well, I, I, I hope you've got a, ni- a nice Christmas present, Michael, after all that. Uh, <laughs> look, there's, um, there's, uh, there's, uh, you do a fantastic job as well on the BT coverage. That, that, that doesn't even need to be said. But there's a couple more listener questions that we do just have time for. So I've chosen some meaty ones uh, for you. Pete will like these as well. Um, the first one is from uh, Nick Manning. And I know, I know Keith will definitely have something to say on this, but we'll come to Michael first. Uh, with the inevitable, inevitable rise of electric vehicles, and the impending ban on uh, internal combustion <laughs> engine vehicles in the next 10 years or so. How long do you think, if at all, uh, before Dorna decide uh, to allow electric bikes into the current classes like they did uh, with CRT? Honestly, I don't see that ever happening. I just, I think there's uh, there's life in the internal combustion engine with um, synthetic fuels, with direct air capture, with making a carbon neutral mm. sport. Yes, we're never going to be fully carbon neutral, but there is a way that the bikes will run completely carbon neutral. So I know the, the actual technology is available now that we could we could produce a fuel that, that is carbon neutral and we could run the GP bikes on it, similar octane. And that would be from um, using hydrogen energy, essentially with the direct air capture and then, and then turning that into a synthetic fuel. So the technology is there. I don't think there's any boundaries that... that will mean that we have to kill off the internal combustion engine. There will be an electric class. I believe Moto E will continue to grow and fair play to it, but it's not my thing. I, I don't see the, yes, we're racing two wheels and the set of handlebars and bike boys are racing against each other, but I don't, I think it loses a lot of what I love about the sport, the noise, the, the 
the delay in that transition from picking up the throttle to feeling it through the rear tire, you know, the, through your 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 drivetrain that you get on a bike, you don't have that electric instant. So just even the you speak to the riders, it's not the same feeling. So for me, I'm not against electric vehicles. I like them. I considered getting a Tesla myself, but I'd see the the um, possibilities of of all these different um, carbon neutral uh, solutions going forward and working together. But for me, we're never going to kill the internal combustion engine. And I think. Uh, MotoGP will have a long future with that that power plant underneath it. Maybe a hybrid, perhaps, but not not a fully electric one. Okay. I loved you until you said I'm considering a Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> it. So Keith, that's never happening in your book, is it? Um, well, it's got to go a long way yet. And the trouble is that the hype is, is, I mean, I don't want to bore everybody with stuff that we've already been over on this podcast before, but I mean, I just think that the electric um, brigade in, in this country is, is it's, it's a bit like the diesel thing where they were shouting and hollering that diesel was got to be so, you know, because it, it was, it was a better, better form of propulsion for more efficient, so on and so forth. And then all of a sudden somebody worked out that it was noxious as hell. I think electric vehicles in town, in cities, yeah. I mean, I think from a, the, the byproduct on a on an electric vehicle is brilliant. Um, but the whole concept of it being carbon neutral is just a complete fallacy. It's just mm. wrong. You know, the, the, the making of batteries, the digging up of pressure metals, the, the making of a battery and then having to, you know, where are you going to dump it in five years' time, just like your phone battery when that's gone wrong? You know, let's dig a big hole and stick all this stuff in. It just doesn't work for me. And as Michael said, on a more serious note, other than me being as flippant as usual over electric vehicles, um, you know, there are other technologies. And I think where it's going to where it's going to prove is in Formula One. I think Formula One are ahead of the game on this. And they've they're probably going to pick up this you know, earlier than the MotoGP will. But there are fuels out there, there are fuels and, and motors being developed that can run, you know, virtually carbon neutral with, without all the bull that we get around electricity. I mean, it, it's it's. It's a funny thing. I was speaking with one of the major power distribution people. I, I mean, I won't go into why I would be speaking to people like that. But Western Power here are concerned in this region about where the delivery of the extra electricity that we will need for the national grid to run all this stuff on if we go as quickly as they're aiming to go with electricity. I can just see it being delayed and delayed and delayed and being overtaken by a better technology at some stage in the not too distant future, which hopefully will keep our internal combustion engine going on a racing circuit because honestly if it all goes electric it's yeah terrible. it's just who wants to listen to that bloody wine <laughs> honestly and the you know the weight of the things at the moment they are so they are nowhere near in a situation where we can have them in a proper racing series it's not a grand prix it's a world cup moto e it's not considered a grand prix dorna covered off what happened to formula one in other words somebody grabbed the rights to the electric series um and basically work it outside of the of the then eccleston package um dorna were quite clever in that they brought in moto e alongside just in case they covered off the possibility of a another world championship gaining momentum uh, in parallel to their own motor gp series but those bikes are so far behind in, in, in real technology, in suspension, in weight, in performance, in longevity. They can't even do, they can't do more than six or seven laps and they've run out of gas. You know, it's, and, and when you, when you turn up at a racetrack and there's not enough power at the racetrack to, 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 to actually recharge the Moto E bikes and there's this bloody great cable that goes 100 yards around the back to some dirty great spewing diesel generators to, to give them the actual power they need to, to race on. It's all smoke and mirrors. We we I we've hate. had we've had the discussion so many times, uh, especially in our, in our Moto E Focus show. Um, so I, I don't want to dredge up old things, Pete. But it's it's difficult, you know. Hearing Michael and Keith, it's difficult to disagree with that. I would argue that yes, I think in the first year of I, I'm not entirely sure of Moto E, but certainly of Formula E, you know, with the, the diesel generator thing, that was a bit farcical. But I know that has changed and that has stopped, and it is more sustainable. But, but do you find that difficult to to disagree with with Keith and Michael? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that, you know, in a way, maybe we need to reframe the, the the conversation. You know, at the moment, we're looking at ways to contribute to society in the future through renewable fuels or technology. But we could also do it with safety. You know, we spoke about before is that there are ways to improve, use the airbag technology to warn people of, um, you know, riders of, of accidents ahead. Alicia Spargo kind of went further than that. He was saying that he wants and 
part of his discussion of what to do with improved safety on the with the smaller classes is you know maybe we'll get to a stage where automatically you know race control could just you know lower the revs of the bikes in a certain sector if there's an accident if there's a rider rider comes off the bike airbags deployed the bikes automatically slow down now you know that's a long way off i think but i think that if safety could, could just, be improved in that way, you. let's say, right. yeah. <laughs> but if I can just see race direction suddenly, <laughs> <laughs> I, actually, I think it would be it would have to be automatic, wouldn't it? I think, it, yeah, you couldn't even have race direction doing a, it. A but, big red button, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everyone stop. But um, you know, we are hearing a lot of this this uh, anti collision technology that's coming with these these vehicles these days. All cars have all these cameras and sensors on for parking, all of this kind of thing. I think that there's ways that, that motorsport can contribute. At the moment, it's all focused on, well, we need to be doing renewables because that's obviously the big issue for the industry. But as, as, as the guys have been saying, really the car industry is probably going to decide a lot of what the technology is for motorbikes because they're going to pump so much money in. They've got much bigger budgets to use and they will develop the systems that we will then adapt in, in bike racing, certainly in performance bike racing. I think electric will be useful for the small, very small, as we see, kind of this e-bike scooter category that's kind of merging together. I think that could work in that situation. But it's hard to imagine, as Michael says, that you know the Grand Prix classes can suddenly go to electric because the, the limitations on the power are so big. So yeah, I think it's it's expecting a little bit much for, for that to happen. Yeah, and, and you've segued so brilliantly there because I did want to just, as a, as a cheeky small question, Michael, I saw on your Instagram that you've been testing one of these new electric scooter bikes that's coming for next season. I just, I'm just fascinated by this championship in particular. What, what, what was it like? Like, do you have, have you got your eye on it for next year? Do you want to be part of it? <laughs> well, I, I obviously I wouldn't have the time to be part of it, but I did. I was quite wow. intrigued by it. Obviously, the the micro scooters around the the cities. I've, I've rode them in in Austin, Texas. Actually, last year, or sorry, 2019 was the first experience I had. And I was like, oh, these are quite a cool thing to ride. And now they're they're definitely increasing in popularity. And um, Alex Wirtz, uh, from former. Formula, former Formula One driver had uh, contacted me about uh, testing it and get, given my impression. So I went and had a spin on it and was really impressed. Actually, it's two wheel drive. It's got a lot of power. I was riding it knee down, which nobody really does at the moment because I just feel more comfortable with me down and lower center of gravity. So it was quite a fast thing to ride, but I'd seen Bradley Smith tested it the other week and he rode it standing up the, the typical way that you would expect to ride a, a micro scooter. But yeah, it was quite impressive actually, but similar restraints, short distances, having to cool the, the battery and then recharge it in the time frame. But what they're planning to do with the ESC series and race in cities and, and have heats and knockouts. And I think it'll be a great spectacle and one that I'm interested to see how it progresses. So yeah, I've always, always liked to, to experience new things and it was quite a, quite an interesting test on it and there's definitely some potential from the the little scooters that it was definitely more powerful than i imagined and and it, actually how it could corner and everything as well it was quite an impressive bit of kit you should come to northampton michael we have a we have an electric scooter grand prix every single night of the week <laughs> really <laughs> we are part of the experimental series and um, there's little old ladies knocked over hedges. There's um, <laughs> bikes left laying in the street, in the streams, chucked on the railway lines. We've we've got boy scooters everywhere. Yeah, I'm I'm fascinated idea. by this little championship. I think it's going to be nothing like it, is there? It would be. I think it would be brilliant. But uh, look, Michael, we've taken up so much of your time. I want to ask you one more question that's come in, uh, and, and I think this is a good one for everyone just to chime in on and um, to sort of round things off. This is from uh, Babe Mukal. Um, do you think uh, the latest developments by some factories uh, like the Aero and the Wings and the whole shot device, rear scoop electronics and all of that is making MotoGP a bit more like Formula One, where machine has more significance in the final outcome uh, than the man? Is Burgess's claim that MotoGP is 20% bike, 80% rider still true, do you think? Um. <laughs> It's a difficult one to say for sure. In some ways, I would actually argue the the opposite and now say that it's more man than machine than it ever was in the past because you had disparity. You had uh, you had an NSR 500 Honda back in the 90s that absolutely smoked everything else down the street, so you had a speed advantage, whereas now very little to, to take between horsepower, between uh, cornering, between tire. All the tires are obviously, it's a control tire, control electronics. So the actual... Um, input now it's more uh, rider crew factory it's a it's a whole package and that all has to come together to to be a champion but then whenever you boil it down to 
Fabio versus Peco versus Vinales versus Jack Miller. I think it is the rider on the day that really steps up and makes the difference because the level of the equipment is so similar. And it is thanks to all those developments. So every manufacturer have had to, they've had to step up. Aprilia have been the, the latest to join the party and all their upgrades and bringing it to that that level. And now we've got six manufacturers that have bikes that can win races. We've never had that in the past. It's always, for a long time, it was only Honda and Yamaha. Then it became Honda, Yamaha and Ducati. Then Suzuki have joined the party again. KTM have joined the party in the last two seasons. And now Aprilia are there as well. So for me, it's a, it's a golden era of MotoGP, and and I would say that the rider who wins the championship, if it is Fabio Quattararo, is the best rider, irrespective of his equipment, because there's so many other bikes and riders on the grid with a similar structure, similar team, similar package, similar bike, and they didn't quite make it happen. So I would say now more than ever, it when the rider wins the championship, they are the most deserving rider. Could be argued that Yamaha is the least of the. Um... Alien machines, really. When you True. look at the Ducati, it looks like a spaceship, and the <laughs> Yamaha looks like a motorbike. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's it's just, well, for coming from a Formula One background as well, it is sometimes there's an argument. You know, we don't want all this tech stuff, do we, Pete? It kind of ruins the racing a little bit. We want to see the raw, you know, man versus man, and it, or racer versus racer that you should say. But you know, it, it, do what do you think, Pete? Do you agree with that? What Bubba said, or do you agree with the, the guys? I think I think it's, you need the balance of both, don't you? I mean, MotoGP is supposed to be the prototype class, so and we want it to be. You know, the problem we've had is that Superbike and MotoGP for many years was hard to distinguish for people that didn't know the two sports quite well. So it, it's great now that people can see visually these differences. That the devices that you mentioned, we can see them. That's the other great thing. You know, we might have had fantastic technology before hidden inside an engine, and, and we never knew about it. Or you know, a stunning breakthrough with the electronic software. Well. You know, there's there's nothing that we could see as as you know fans and, and media that that tells you that's happened. So it's great to see things that, that visually people are interested in. It gets people talking about the sport. And as Keith said, that the stat earlier about all of the podiums. I mean, it, it's it's so close, as Michael said, that it it's it's got both both sides. It's not that races are being won just because someone's got this technology. It's it's just that the races is so. The racing is so close that the technology matters, even if it is just a tenth of a second a lap. Suddenly, a tenth of a second is meaningful. Um, I mean, Michael's years in MotoGP. I mean, it must, when you think back now, it must seem like a crazy adventure for you, Michael. You know, to take a superbike engine and build a frame and go up against Honda, Yamaha. You know, <laughs> as you guys did back then, and then you look at the the, the satellite bikes now. And, and they are, you know, Frankie Morbidelli and, and, and Fabio winning three races each last year, more than the factory Yamaha team. I mean, it's it's been such a turnaround to get to this stage, isn't it? And I think that they, they've got it right. I think the, the slight fear is the technical, technical freeze is ending. What's going to happen next year? Are we going to see gaps appear? That's maybe the question mark that I, that I might have. But otherwise, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm a big fan of the tech. I know Michael is as well. Well, it's uh, it's certainly going to be uh, exciting going into to next year, and uh, plenty of discussions to have as well. As we keep keep saying this year, can't wait for next year, but we're ex- we're enjoying this year as well. We're getting into the uh, the final few rounds of it. Michael, I, I, thank you for firstly for coming onto the show and giving up your time. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, to have you on. Uh, before we let you go, though, uh, we us three will be back for our, our preview show for uh, Misano next week. While we've got you, Michael, who's your money on? For Mizano, I think Peko, again, he was so strong there in the first visit. I think it's hard to look past him, but I was impressed with Fabio giving digging in, taking chances that he didn't need to do in the race there. So, yeah, he wouldn't rule out Fabio, but I think it's going to be another duel between those two. It will certainly uh, be exciting, hopefully, nonetheless. Well, that is it from us here on the uh, the Crash MotoGP podcast. We shall return with you uh, this time next week for more MotoGP chat as we preview uh, Miss Sano. But you can keep up to date with all the very latest as ever on Crash.net. Any questions, we try and get them answered as many as we can. I hope if I've missed your question today, I'm so sorry. Uh, but we, we are on limited on time. But thank you for sending them in. Do continue to do that in all the usual ways in the comments section or tweet Instagram uh, or Facebook us. Just search Crash. Moto GP. And please do leave us a review uh, wherever you get your podcasts as well. And we shall see you right back here next week. Bye bye. <laughs>